He's uh, Brandel Chambly, works for the Golf Channel, former PGA Tour golfer, and uh, he joins us now. Uh, give me the scenario here, Brandel, of, of how this played out for Tom Watson and Tiger Woods. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm imagining he didn't text him. He called him, and uh, I'm sure Tom Watson was pretty relieved because in between now and when he makes his pick September 2nd, I'm sure every single day he would have been asked 100 times, are you going to take Tiger, are you going to take Tiger? So uh, I think Tiger did the right thing. Would how could Tiger have convinced Watson to pick him by playing well and not, <laughs> well, okay and, and not grabbing his back? You know, every time Tiger Woods showed up this year, which wasn't very often, he didn't look like Tiger Woods uh, in in any way, uh, shape or form, and in, and in particular his last two events. So I, I couldn't even imagine how Tom could have ever taken him. I, I understand the commercial appeal and interest if if Tiger is there, but, you know, Tom Watson's first loyalty is to the team, and I think they would have looked askance at him for picking not only a player who's not playing well, but a player who's got a really poor record in the Ryder Cup, but also a player who's got a, a bad back. We don't know how bad the back is because he said that the last injury was back spasms, had nothing to do with back surgery. Still with the back, um, are they at – one lead to another, or are they totally separate and Tigers should be able to resume playing this season? Well, personally, I think the, the sw- his swing, what he's doing with his swing over the last two or three years is causing his bad back, and it's, it's not that complicated. In essence, uh, you know, just coming into the ball, he leans backward and then jumps up with his legs. So, I mean, if you just if you actually slow mode his swing and then pause it at impact, it would make your back hurt with Dan. And he, and he does it. Hundreds of times, thousands of times. But, but does he know he's Every, doing this, though, Brandel? <laughs> evidently not. Uh, you know, I I don't know. Uh, I don't know what he's looking at. But if you uh, if you look at his swing in slow motion, I cannot imagine um, how his back has even held up this long. So he'll, in my opinion, he'll keep re-injuring it until he changes his golf swing. Would he ever go back to Butch Harmon? Uh, no, he wouldn't, and Butch wouldn't take him. I mean, there's nothing to gain for you know for Butch. I mean, Butch you know walked away from that, having coached perhaps the the greatest golf anybody had ever seen. You know, it's not a matter of would he go back to Butch. Uh, you know, would he go back to Hank? Would he go back to anybody who's made him play the golf that he played at at an unbelievable level? But at this point, I think he's pretty dead set on on sticking with Sean and proving the world wrong. He has disassembled his swing before. Why doesn't he disassemble, reassemble, and act like a 38, 39-year-old instead of a 24-year-old? <laughs> yeah, because he's had so much success. Even even back when he was a kid, I remember reading before he won the U.S. Amateur at, uh, at uh, the, the TPC at Sawgrass that he had just spent a year and a half retooling his golf swing. That was after he'd won three U.S. Juniors and two U.S. Amateurs, and off he went. And then we got on tour, he's done it three or four times, and each time he's come back and killed people. But, uh, you know, I think he did it because he was bored because he, he didn't have anybody who could beat him, even when he was working on his golf swing consistently. So he got away with it, and so he got into this routine where he was always looking for perfection. And finally, age and injuries and the competition caught up with him, and, uh, and they caught him out. I love that you say that, that – why would you disassemble a swing that is the best in the world and gave you dominance and you think he was bored? I think he was. You know, there was nobody. He could win <laughs> by 12, 15, 8 shots. He looked around and and he thought, well, hey, listen, if he if he, did, if he would have been playing that golf and somebody would have been one shot back or somebody would have been beating him in major championships, he wouldn't have had time to tinker. He'd have been trying to compete. But I think he thought, look, I've got, I'm so much better than anybody else. I can even get better. And in the downturn, while I'm changing my swing, nobody's still going to, nobody's going to beat me. And by and large, they didn't. Uh, and, and when he finally, you know, got the tinkering done and went ahead and played and, and forgot about what he was doing, then from 2000, well, 99 to 2002, he was almost unbeatable. And then 2005 to 2009, he won 41% of his tournaments when, <laughs> when, when the best players of all time have won about four or five or six or eight percent of their tournaments. Rory's run here, and I put it next to Tiger's best run of all time. How would you compare, contrast, favor? I, I think they're similar. You know, the thing that was amazing about Tiger Woods was that he did it 
for such a long period of time. And there have been players who've dominated golf. Hogan did it in 1953. Arnold Palmer did it in the early 60s. Jack Nicklaus sort of dominated for a long period of time, but he had brilliant flashes in the early 70s, as did Johnny Miller. But Tiger did it for, unlike anything anybody had ever seen, for about 15, 16, 17 years. So can Rory do that? Well, I mean, I, I think we're, we're, we're holding him to a ridiculous standard. I think we should enjoy what Rory is doing because I never actually thought I would see anybody play the type of golf that Tiger played in 2000, and here we got somebody doing it. Good to visit with you, Brando. You guys did a great job at the PGA, you and Frank and uh, Rich and the entire crew there at the Golf Channel. Oh, thanks so much, Dan. It was fun. Uh, always nice talking to you. You have a good week. All right. Brando Chambly.